and what you could see was scaring the hell out of you. I suppose the best way of describing it is that uh, events were biblical. <laughs> We've gotten this, uh, it's a little bit larger than ash is what's falling right now from Mount Pinatubo, which has been erupting uh, steadily all afternoon. We've also had a number of earthquakes and even some thunderstorms on a wild afternoon in the Philippines. At, at about 15 minutes of two, about 1.45 in the afternoon, there was just a blast as we stood and we just watched the, our instruments for half an hour and they were just pegged. In other words, they're just going as hard as they could. And then finally, our instrument sites between the mountain and Clark Air Base just ceased to function. When we lost the instruments, the last instruments up close to the volcano, uh, our thought was that there were probably knocked out by pyroclastic flows. And um, of course, there was a possibility that they could have been moving towards us. Because of that, some people moved to the center of the building for a while. If we were hit, that might afford a little bit more protection. Yeah, I don't know. We had, you know, four cinder block walls between us and the and the mountain. And you know, the way the the ash clouds come down, you know, it's this great sort of hurricane force wind and and rocks and just a just a, an awful mess. And uh, you know, you figure if you hunker down behind a wall, maybe you'll Maybe you'll uh, you'll come through it, and and you know the roof will come off, and uh, a lot of debris will fly around. But you know maybe you'll be okay. We had some calm, frightened moments. Nobody could decide what to do, what to think, really. Andy Lockhart had just made some popcorn, and John looks over and sees Andy eating popcorn, and says, uh, "What are you doing eating popcorn at a time like this?" And Andy says, I, I always eat popcorn at this part of the movie. <laughs> this is 4.10 in the afternoon, raining stones, pebbles. Finally, the decision is made to leave. Six months later, General Studer remembers that moment at a conference in San Francisco. What? What led me to make the decision on the 15th of June to get the last 30 or so of us out of Clark and head up toward the Agricultural College was a guy by the name of Andy who ran past me saying, General, you better put jam in your pockets because we're all about to be toast. <laughs> I walked out and uh, opened up a door to a carry-all, and there was a there was a driver in there crossing himself, and I I said. Uh, do you know how to get to this place? And he said, no. So I closed the door and chose another vehicle. <laughs> Pitch darkness, raining mud, hummus balls that size bouncing off the car. And, and, and by that time, it was, it, it was, um, we, we, I, you know, it's just like, like our, our dignities were still in place. We, we were not completely panicked. It was an orderly um, but uh, a retreat that we were very confident we were doing the right thing. There was, a, there was no question about any, anybody's courage left anymore. I don't, I don't regret leaving at all. And I think if I was put in that situation again, I'd, <laughs> I might have left sooner. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, no, no, I don't, I don't regret, uh, I don't regret leaving at all. It was, uh, it was a huge eruption, and, uh, I think, uh, just 
psychologically, I was, I was just happy to get away, to go anywhere else, as long as it was away from where that eruption was happening. I think if I'd still been on the base and I'd started feeling these earthquakes, uh, I don't know, you know, I might have come unglued. As it was, it was, you know, it was a, a week of almost no sleep and, and incredible stress. And, uh, and then to have this sort of constant earthquake activity was unnerving. Uh, as it turned out, I, some of us had the best sleep we'd had in a week that night, being rocked to sleep by these things and knowing that we were, that we were away, away from, uh, well, we were a little bit further away. Uh, we didn't know if we were far enough away, but we were, you know, it was just important to leave. Uh, and if I'd, if I'd been on base uh, when that seismicity kicked in, I don't know, it, it would have been... It would have been bad. Thanks to the prediction, virtually everyone within 15 miles of Pinatubo was evacuated before the cataclysmic eruption. But the huge blast, coupled with the typhoon, spreads devastation far beyond the evacuation zone. Angeles and Olongapo are buried in ash up to a foot deep. Innumerable roofs collapse under the weight of rain-soaked ash and the near constant shaking from earthquakes. While tens of thousands of Filipinos suffer in the aftermath of Pinatubo, the evacuation has kept the death toll to under 500. Photographers who venture into the area near the mountain discover a surreally monochromatic landscape. side is blanketed with ash. As far as 50 miles away, farm fields and pastures are buried. In the weeks and months to come, one half of the region's farm animals die. No estimates about the impact on wildlife are available. Weeks after the cataclysmic eruption of June 15th, Mount Pinatubo is still spewing forth ash and rock. It is now recognized as the largest volcanic eruption in 80 years. The total volume of products produced by the eruption can only be broadly estimated. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of five to maybe eight cubic kilometers of, uh, of uh, ash deposits of various kinds. And 